Uh, I just want to follow up on, on one of Jens's comments. Jens, uh, carry that moniker of you being a dinosaur with pride, because remember, the dinosaurs walked on this planet for over 50 million years, and we were only, we've only been here less than 2 million years. So a dinosaur is something to be proud of. So, so with that, I, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts on artificial intelligence, uh, preoperative planning. Yeah, coming from me, artificial intelligence is probably a bit of an oxymoron, you know, simple bone setter, bone broke, fix. But it, it's a very exciting field, and it is the next frontier that we are going through. Uh, in the spirit of disclosures, I do have uh, relationships with each of those entities. The one at the bottom, Agada Medical, that is a company that I am intimately involved with, and I will be discussing some of the concepts of, of what Agada Medical is working on. Uh, spine surgery. Uh, for years, we, we've been putting up an x-ray. We take out our micrometers, we take out uh, our goniometers, and we mark things and we measure, but then we end up cutting with a chainsaw. We we're just haven't been as accurate as we could be. We try, but we just have not had the tools. And for years, I've been saying that the decision is always far more important than the incision. Coming to the operating room prepared, maintaining, sticking to your indications, knowing what equipment you're gonna have, and always having your plan A, plan B, and plan C at hand, ready to go, so if you have to call the audible in the middle of surgery, you know what you're gonna do. So it's the decision that's way more important than the incision. And spine surgery is all about control, because all of us that have been there have experienced that, that sinking feeling when all of a sudden you are not in control of that case. Something has gone wrong, and we have to be prepared for it. So this is where I've been a devout evangelical pre-operative planning advocate. It's like you've got to come to the operating room prepared. Now, if you were about to, to build a house and the contractor said, yeah, I'll build the wall here, or I'll put the kitchen here, I'll put the bedroom here, but they didn't show you blueprints. They didn't show you a, a bill of material. Would you hire that contractor? No, no, no one would do that. If you were about to get on a commercial flight and you heard that the pilot didn't do his pre-flight plan, didn't know or doesn't know how much fuel he has on board, didn't check the weather up ahead, would you get on that plane with that pilot? Not one of us would. So there's so many examples of this out there, yet as surgeons, we've been lacking. We haven't come to the operating room prepared. And, and I used to say, you know, you take your x-ray, you put it up, you'll, you say, okay, I'll put a screw here, cut the bone here, and you conceive some kind of plan. And at the end of the case, you look at the x-ray, you go, Ugh, that's not quite what I had planned. And I used to affectionately call those trunk films because I put them in the trunk of my car. And when I sold the car, I never emptied the trunk because I didn't want to ever see those x-rays again. So we have to get away from that. And the way we get away from it is preoperative planning. Now, this is the real problem that we face as spine surgeons. We are under tremendous scrutiny right now. We know that we can do good. We know that we can change people's lives. But despite that, nearly a third of the spinal surgeries that we do do not result in the outcome that we expect or leave the patients with prolonged disability. Now, if you look at the numbers in U.S. today, the third of spinal surgeries that fail result in a $5.6 billion revision burden. That's huge. That's absolutely huge, and that's something that we have to address. We cannot leave that the way it is right now. So this is what we need. As spine surgeons, we are unable to quantify the forces along the full length of the spine, 
and we can't predict what's going to happen when we intervene. Now, I use the analogy of an architect and an engineer. An architect can design the most substantial building structure beautiful, but he doesn't have the tools to keep that building standing. That's where the structural engineer comes in. He has the tools. So what we need to do is transform the art or architecture of spine surgery into the science or engineering of spine surgery. And the way we do that is with AI for preoperative planning. It's relatively straightforward. Today, we've got great tools. We know how to take a history. We've got amazing imaging and diagnostic capabilities. We can create all these fancy models. And now, and what you're going to see today and some of the stuff that Roger showed in other talks, we've got tremendous technology to execute, to make us all better surgeons when we execute. I know today, 32 years into my practice, that I'm a better surgeon than I was two years into my practice. And it's not because I can hold the scalpel better. It's because I've made all the mistakes which are helping me plan the next surgery better. So that's where the AI comes in. And that's where we have to bridge the gap between the diagnostics and imaging and our surgical plan and execution. We've got a patient, we've got a doctor, we've got the implants. We need the recipe. That same six foot four individual with a degenerative four or five spondylolisthesis goes to Tampa or Topeka, he's gonna get six different operations of which a third are gonna fail. And that's what we have to get away from. We need to standardize on the basis of biomechanics, patient, operating room, equipment, and what we want to do with it. So what we are working on, this is a project that I've been involved with now for a number of years, is a deep learning neural network for preoperative planning. And you assimilate the anthropometric data, the demographic data, the patient co medical comorbidity data, our diagnostic data, and then we run a dynamic analysis on the spine in its native state. You can then simulate the various surgical procedures, run the dynamic analysis again, and using the machine learning and the predictive analytics, you can figure out how the biomechanics on the spine are gonna change all the way up and down. And this is how we transform spine surgery from this heuristic trial and error architecture type approach to a scientific approach with prescriptive and predictive analytics. So here's just some examples of how the AI can really help us. Right now, we're able to create these digital twins. There's all this segmentation technology and using AI to recognize anatomical features, you can create a patient model. But again, using the machine learning, you can transform that patient model into a dynamic analysis model and get a patient-specific dynamic analysis model. So I can analyze that exact patient. It's not generic. It's exactly what's happening in that individual's spine. The biomechanical simulation model is a multimodal dynamic model. You've got multiple different segments that are connected. So you got the bones, the muscles, the ligaments, the discs. Now we're all aware that the muscles act as the actuators of movement. The ligaments are the restraints to movement and the discs are the modulators of the movement. And all of that can be modeled into a mathematical equation. Now, the equation seeks neutrality. It always has to be balanced. And that's how this engineering works behind this. And this is how the predictive analytics can figure out what's going to go on. So what you can do is what's called a forward dynamics analysis, where you provide the forces, and that predicts how much the spine's going to move. Or an inverse dynamics, where you provide the movement 
and predict what the forces are going to be up and down the spine. So the inverse dynamics is particularly suited to what we want to do. And you can simulate all sorts of different activities. And this is where we get into patient-specific things. You've got a patient that wants to be a golfer. Maybe they weren't a golfer beforehand, but they want to be a golfer. And you're contemplating an L3 to S1 fusion. You want to know what the forces are going to be above and below, and are they going to be able to swing a golf club again? So you can actually model that. You can model in the movements associated with a golf swing to predict the forces at the 2-3 level and tell that patient, yeah, you're going to get that 3 to the S1 fusion, but five years from now, you're going to absolutely break down that if you play golf again. Or maybe, and this is to my TBI heritage right now, we should be thinking about some kind of motion technology. So you model a disc replacement as opposed to a fusion. And you can see what's going on above and below. So this is how it actually works, where you take the imaging studies, you create that patient-specific spine segmentation, then you get the digital twin. Then in the middle screen, you run that dynamic force analysis. And all of this happens in the background. The surgeon doesn't see any of this. But then you simulate the different surgical strategies, you compare that to the native biomechanics, and then the surgeon decides, okay, this is the surgery that I feel is most appropriate. Once that surgery is executed, we assimilate that information into the deep learning neural network, and over time, as we collect cases, 100 cases, 1,000 cases, 10,000 cases, 100,000 cases, right now, there's over 750,000 fusions being done in the U.S. each year. Depending on who you believe, there's probably actually more. But think, if we just captured all that information in one year, how much smarter we would be. And this is the tool that we can use to optimize that surgical outcome. Now, this is also pretty intimidating because when you get into the predictive analytics, and we've shown this to a number of, of individuals, and, and a lot of our colleagues, they're relatively insecure. Surgeons are pretty insecure. Say, no, 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 I don't want some machine telling me what to do or, or how to do it. But you're absolutely right. This type of technology is going to be telling some of us in the room that we shouldn't be doing the surgery. It may say, Lieberman, you did 100 degenerative 4 or 5 spondylolisthesis last year. 40% of them failed. You should not be doing this operation anymore. And that's something that we're going to have to really find a way to control and worry about. Either control the population doing the surgery or control who's running this technology. Now, this is a case demonstration. So you can see on the uh, far right there, my far right, 77-year um, young female, sagittal imbalance, coronal imbalance, terrible spinal stenosis, clear indications for surgical intervention. Using the currently available preoperative planning software, I plan the surgery, I execute the surgery, I use all the technology I have at my disposal, and I get what I feel is an ideal result. But nothing destroys your confidence like follow-up. Six months later, she comes back with two broken rods at the L5-S1 junction. This was not supposed to happen. If you look at it, I took this and analyzed it with our AI component, and it absolutely predicted the increased stresses of the rod at the L5-S1 level. The red line is the titanium yield point for that rod. L5-S1, two and a half times the stresses at that level. So there's no doubt. Now, if I would have known that one tidbit of information prior to surgery, I could have avoided the revision in her. That's stuff that we just don't have access to today. And this is why AI is going to be a must-have. Now, this is what it kind of looks like. This is sort of our, our approach to it, where we create the model, and again, all of the measurements, the AI is out there to identify landmarks and give us these measures so we don't have to sit there and measure things on an x-ray anymore. The AI can also assess the Furman grade, the degenerative level of the disc. 
It can give you the differential between supine and standing measurements. So you can get an indication of just how flexible that spine is going to be. So all of this information gets captured right away. You then go ahead and plan the surgery. And you plan the surgery with the various drop downs. And in here, you put in the levels, the implants you're going to use, the facets you're going to resect, the Smith Pete osteotomies, the ligaments, the approach. Is it an MIS approach, an open approach, anterior, lateral? All of that gets inputted in here. And then the dynamic analysis is run. And this is the type of output that you're going to get. You're going to get this heat map with a red light, green light, yellow light approach. So if you've got a green light, you know that you're not altering the biomechanics at the levels above or below greater than 10%. Now, I don't know if that's the right number yet. These are the numbers that we're starting to base our calculations on. Altering the forces above and below by less than 10% is a go. Anything between 11 and 39% is a yellow light. Think of something else. But anything over a 40% alteration in forces, I intuitively feel is wrong. And we have to avoid that. We have to maintain the native biomechanics. So in this instance here, this is an L4 to S1 fusion. You can clearly see that I'm altering the biomechanics at 5.1 appropriately, 4.5, a uh, little bit uh, yellow light there. Uh, sorry, 4.5 is fused, but 3.4 uh, uh, is a red light there. You can see uh, the lateral shear force on L3.4 is amplified, so you've got over a 40% probability of failure and right now, the database is out to 90 days on this. And, and we're building. We're getting going from that. And you can see, you can get the probability or risk analysis on hardware failure, bone failure, fusion success, PJK, DJK. With the deep learning neural network, we've got patient-reported outcome measures, functional outcomes, cage subsidence, screw pullout, all the measures that, that are important to us. Now, this is an example that I want to show you guys because I learned a lot from, from this one case. This is a degenerative L4-5 spondylolisthesis. And on the basis of the clinical symptoms, all I operated on was the L4-5 level. Now, with our dynamic simulation analysis, we ran it using three different cage configurations, 5 degree, 10 degree, 15 degree. You can clearly see if we use the five degree cages, we're increasing the forces at the 3 4 level and at the 5 1 level. That's not good. If we use the 15 degree cage, we're approximating the native biomechanics at the levels above and below. So I think that's safe. I can't tell you that for sure yet, but I think that's safe. So that's just disc shear forces. Here's the facet joint forces. Same case, same modeling, same three cage configurations. If I use the 15 degree cage, which was the better cage for disc shear force, look what happens to the facet joints at 3-4. It protects the facet joints at 3-4 as well. But look at the facet joints at 5-1. If I use the 15 degree cage at 4-5, I'm amplifying the forces at 5-1. What do we do? What do we want to sacrifice? Does anyone here have an idea where we go with this? I don't. This is, again, where AI and machine learning can really help us and figure out what is the compromise under these circumstances. Now, let me show you this. And, and this, I want you to remember what I just showed you with the shear forces and the facet joint forces, because it took me, I remember, simple bone set or bone, bone broke, fix. It took me a while to actually figure this out. The volume, because the, the model is segmental and volumetric, we can assess the stenosis. Now, I tell my patients very often that your spine is like a train on a track. You've got an engine, a caboose, and all the cars in the middle. If you pull the middle car off the track, something happens to the engine and caboose. So look at the 4-5 level. Remember, I only operated on the degenerative 4-5 spondy. Pre-op stenosis volume at the disc level was 0.29 cc's. Post-op volume, 1.28 cc's for a 336% increase. 
Big deal. We know we were there. We know we reduced the listhesis. That's what we would expect. But look at what happened at L5S1. Pre-op, this individual had stenosis there, 0.346 cc's. Post-op, the volume increased to two full cc's. By putting the train back on the track, I indirectly avoided a distal junctional issue in her, avoided the stenosis in her. Now, think of this, and I had to go back and reanalyze the alignment. Because remember what I showed with the facet joint forces. In the native state, the L5-S1 facet joints were offloaded because that disc was tilted into kyphosis. When we reduced 4-5, we reloaded those facet joints in a normal fashion. So that's what the machine learning learns in this. So it wasn't really an increase. We weren't really sacrificing the L5-S1 facet joints. What we were doing was loading them back to their native state, which should have been if they didn't have the degenerative spondy. So these are the types of things that we're learning, that we're working on, and why AI is critically important. So all of this stuff that, that we're seeing now, we're in such a privileged position right now in that there's all this technology on the shelf. It's all just sitting there. We just have to figure out how to incorporate it to the best of our patient's benefit. And one technology does not obviate the other. They're all complementary, as, as Roger pointed out. So AI for preoperative planning is not going to make a bad surgeon good. What it is going to do is going to make a good surgeon that much better because you're going to have that much more information. It's like the commercial pilot who knows now that there's a thunderstorm up ahead and he's going to fly around the other way. And if you look at all other aspects of life, today, the lawyers cannot do their job without their AI platform, their Westlaw precision platform, so that they can write their briefs, get their information, and figure out everything going on. The financial world, the financial world wouldn't exist the way we know it today without Bloomberg Terminal right now. Everybody relies on Bloomberg Terminal. And I certainly see the day where this deep learning neural network for spine surgery is a must have for us. And of course, there's a little bit of a selfish component. I know I'm gonna need spine surgery at some point. So I'm gonna to wanna to make sure that whoever's operating on me has this information. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Izzy, that, that's an incredible talk, and uh, I, I'm really inspired by it because uh, my practice has transformed, um, as some of the guys around me in this room know, to um, uh, motion preservation, artificial disc technology, and I've never, ever really been a uh, fan of fusion surgery ever since, you know, when I was a resident, some guy wanted me to review his cases, which were just, they, people kept coming back all the time. I mean... This was 35 years ago. I mean, this makes so much sense. I look at that one level and I just say, you know what, how can that fix the rest of them? It makes sense to me. And I think this is, this is essential. It has to happen now, not something in the future to fix your back down the road when you're in retirement. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I've learned the same lessons that you've learned over time. And uh, that's why... I've committed a lot of effort to this right now, and we've got a great uh, team working on this um, within Texas Back as well as outside of Texas Back. Second, uh, the comment, um, Patrick, this is an, a visionary talk and amazingly uh, multidimensional. Thank you, Izzy. The reptilian dinosaur brain in me wants to voice the, uh, the thoughts of um, caution in terms of who controls the data and who gets to make the decision. Because this is absolutely awesome what you're doing. And uh, having worked in our um, system here on a more or less decision-making algorithm, 
I am just all the more in awe of the complexity of our existences. And that starts with our brain, ends with our brain. Yes, Patrick, yes, Danielle. Um, but it also goes into connective tissues, muscle, muscles, psychosocial settings, etc. The variables and how to calculate those are daunting. But in the end of the day, what really frustrated me beyond belief was the thought of if we then uh, submit to this algorithm, do we deny certain patients the autonomy of decision making because we have a higher entity, that of the AI deity uh, that brings out numbers or where do we draw ethical judgments and again, who calls the shots when we utilize this data? So that's my question to you. That, that's an exceptionally important topic and piece. And uh, you see there's now all these forums uh, in Europe, in Asia, here in the US on regulating AI and how we're going to collect the information and use the information, what we can and cannot use. Uh, quite frankly, I, I don't want to go there. My my goal is to do better for my patients, and this is a tool to do better for my patients, and, and some higher entity is going to decide how we, we actually use this. It's important enough that we do need it, and it may not be the whole picture. We may just look at biomechanics or just look at patient-reported outcome measures or just evaluate bone density with respect to few. There, there's components that can be broken down. But yes, it is very daunting. And yeah, I'll, I'll be cowardly and say, let others make that decision. I, I'm just going to make the, the, I'll develop the, the, the device and let others figure out how to use it. Um, with art, artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligence and machines. And so Jens, the, the, the fears of, it taking over, I think, have to be settled down because there's still variables in every one of those examples that you showed. If you throw a break in the, you know, a, a osteoporosis, or there's still the, the human element is still going to take that this this new data, so it should be embraced, really, and then applied as you have. And I think you're right. Data collection is so important in this. You, we need all the post-operative data of these hundreds of thousands of cases to feed the front end and then the AI will do things we don't even know. Yep, absolutely. Izzy, this, this talk is just blew my mind. I've heard a lot of AI talks. Um, I actually use AI with that uh, Metacrea rod, unit rod right now, and what you just presented uh, just blows that stuff out of the water. When I first heard Chris Ames talk about AI, and how preoperative risk stratification, and after plugging in million data points, it would spit out that you would do, you know, a T10 to pelvis would give you this percent risk factor, risk of failure. And then if you did a T2, it would be a different set of risk factors. And I said, is this what AI is? It's just telling me um, risks and then uh, not really helping us go anywhere or try to make decisions that are appropriate. That I think what's cool about your uh, work is how you bring it back to the patient, patient specific. You um, look at the biomechanics of the patient. There are many points in that where if I had my patient plugged into your AI, I would have been like, I need quadruple rods at L5S1 to prevent that. And that would have prevent, prevent, this is actually AI that will make a, a difference in my practice. So I'm super excited. My mind is blown and I, I, congratulate you for this talk. This is really spectacular. Yeah, th thank you for that. Th this is a decision support tool. That's what this is. Uh, th the AI moniker is the, the fancy word right now, but it's helping us make better decisions. I, I always have to make another comment. Or <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to. And I'm not walking, I'm not walking this back one bit. But the human body is not a perfect place. And I don't think that any of this technology can supplant the judgment, though, completely. Uh, I think that we as surgeons still have the AI that's in our collective brains, I mean, as a, as a community, I, I think still exceeds all of this. But this is powerful technology. I, I agree. Uh, I Thank you, everybody. <laughs>